for the second concert of the classical series, we will be performing the Shostakovich Symphony Number no. 4. Dmitry Shostakovich to me is perhaps one of the most important symphonies of the 20th century. He wrote 15 altogether. But the Fourth Symphony is quite unique because it was written in a very difficult time in the Soviet Union's history. In the darker years of the Stalin uh, regime, composers and artists were basically always in danger because the minute that they wrote music or wrote poems that somehow did not fit the mold of what the regime wanted to convey, they became public enemies. And history is littered with great names of, of great artists that either disappeared or spent extended times at gulags. And Shostakovich had to live with this type of environment pretty much through his entire life. This program is especially unique because it will involve a level of multimedia because the first half will have basically the story of the Fourth Symphony. We will have a couple of actors kind of giving us the background of how the symphony came about. And the title of this is, Is Music Dangerous? Because you see, the symphony was actually banned right before its world premiere. At the dress rehearsals, members of the cultural committee or cultural ministry came to the dress rehearsal and basically accused Shostakovich of being an agent of, of Western influence and felt that the music uh, did not represent the glory of the Soviet Union. And they threatened not only Shostakovich but the conductor in charge of it that if they did not shut down the symphony and not perform it, they would take, and I quote, administrative measures. Administrative measures in Stalinist Russia in the 1930s could only mean one thing. So unfortunately, the piece was canceled, and the premiere would not take place until 35 years later. So the question goes back even in the 21st century, is music dangerous? Can music rile up emotions? Well, apparently back in the 1930s, Stalin used to think so. After the Fourth Symphony came Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, which is probably his most popular and his most famous one. But we cannot understand that symphony without looking at the prism of the Fourth Symphony, which we will be performing. Because you see, the Fourth Symphony is a direct response of what he was feeling after the government basically banned him. So this symphony, I think, will make us all think about the times that we're living on currently and how music can be an agent for a message. The symphony is quite powerful and it has everything that you expect in a Shostakovich work. Emotional, patriotic at times. Shostakovich, I promise you, did not intend this work to become a political tool of any sense. He just wanted to write music. But unfortunately, there were other forces that were utilizing this to send a message. So when you hear the whole story of how Shostakovich had to deal with it and basically put his life in danger, you come to appreciate even more that in throughout history, it takes brave voices sometimes to take a stand and to remind us that through the universal language of music making, we can all be connected and try to at times, rise up and try to do what is right for the world. Nowadays, I think the closest thing we have to that Stalinist regime is North Korea. Absolute control of the government and Big Brother looking after you. And we have to remember that Shostakovich before the Fourth Symphony was the poster child of great Russian music. Unfortunately for him, I guess, Stalin went to see his great opera Lady Macbeth and he didn't like it. And there was this big article the next day on Pravda, the official newspaper of the Communist Party, basically saying that this was muddle, not music. That was the title of the review, unsigned review, by the way, which to this day, many historians even think that Stalin himself wrote it. So Shostakovich went from being, you know, the golden boy of Russian music to being public enemy number one. And this symphony, I think represents a composer trying to make a stand. And although the piece was banned, it was not, it would not disappear. It would make a big comeback 30 years later. And Shostakovich himself said it, that in many ways, the Shostakovich, his fourth symphony, is in many ways better than all the symphonies that came afterwards. 
So when you look at the whole of Shostakovich's output, I mean, he's one of the few co uh, composers who actually made a tenth and then kept going, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, how many of how many of the symphonies that you have you had a chance to conduct? Mm -hmm. Shostakovich wrote 15 symphonies altogether, and uh, I have done about 10 of them. There are a few that I still haven't captured because some of them utilize choir and texts that are in Russian, and I need to dig, dig deeper into the language itself to be able to present them, I think, in a, in a better way. But these are works that I have loved and known for many, many years. Shostakovich is really the greatest sym symphonist of the 20th century in the sense that this was a big part of his output. And in the year that we're celebrating Beethoven's 250th anniversary of his birth, we have to make the connection that Shostakovich was heavily influenced by the great master from Vienna. And he was writing symphonies kind of in that same style. How can you ignore him? The structure itself uh, are very similar to what Beethoven did. But at the same moment, he was writing music in a time that was very difficult for his country and his countrymen particularly with World War II and the horrible suffering that the Soviet Union went through uh, with the invasion of the Nazis and the, the Barbarossa uh, invasion by Hitler, where millions of people died. Shostakovich was a direct witness of that. And in his music, we hear great representations of patriotism. And he utilized his art to inspire people not to bow their heads down, but if anything, defiantly, not allow their culture to disappear. Shostakovich was one of the few great Russian artists that actually never left his country, and he had the chance. But most of the other great Russian artists that we think of through the 20th century, most of them, if not all, left. Rachmaninoff, Stravinsky, Horowitz, they came to the West looking for refuge. Shostakovich stayed. And I think it was a combination of uh, idealism, but I think more importantly, love for his mother country. But at the same moment, through all, every single one of his works that spanned 60 years, we do hear that evolution of what he thought was happening in his motherland. And some of his works are very clearly protest music protesting the reality of what the citizens were going through, the lack of freedom. And I think as the years progressed and he became more popular and really, uh, you know, one of, one of the most important composers of his day, he felt that he could push the envelope, even though he knew he was putting his life in danger. But by the end, I don't think he was as afraid. Stalin had been dead since 1953. And what came next is not that he was easier, but he was not quite the level of brutality that was experienced through the Stalinist year. But I promise you that he was constantly in fear of what might happen to him. But I think the idealism of presenting his thoughts through music was too powerful for him to, to just stop doing. And uh, we hear that in his music. And to this day, he is revered in Russia as a person that not only represented the ideals and the great musical culture of the country, but he's seen more importantly as one of the greatest heroes in the history of that country.